Hey, this is John at Entopology. Today we're going to look at seven tips to help you get started in Entopology and make the most out of the software. In order, we'll talk about visibility, the field viewer, different view types. Next, we'll move on to simulation. We'll look at properties and or what we call chips of some blocks. We'll look at a special block called ramp. And finally, we'll wind up with lattices. So to kick things off, we'll look at the heat sink. Fundamentally, in Entopology, you need to know how to spin, pan, and zoom. This is all done with the right mouse button. With the right mouse button held, you rotate around, hold down Shift to pan, and Control to zoom in and out. Next thing you'll want to do is be able to look at different blocks and isolate them. So if you hit a given block in the UI, if you click on it, hit I, you're only looking at that block. You, uh, you can also right-click and see the different shortcuts here. Visibility is one V. You click on the block and that one will turn on and off. But I is really a handy one. Next important thing is sometimes models might move off your screen or you rotate around, you're not sure where they are. You hit Z or Z on your keyboard. That's going to take you to a home view and make things easier to see. And one of the last things about visibility that's important to note, let's go ahead and uh, show this gyroid heatsink. If you hit Control H, this is going to take you into a high resolution rendering where the CPU is rendering uh, at very high fidelity. Alternatively, you're using your GPU to show rendering, uh, which can operate pretty quickly and is going to show you something uh, very representative of the model. The next interesting thing to note about visibility is this slider option. If I go to, I believe it's this XY period parameter, and I click on that arrow and drag, you're seeing that value change in real time, one of the parameters defining this, and you're getting sort of a primitive rendering up front, and then it's finishing off just a couple seconds later. Okay, now that last thing to note on visibility is you may want to look into a cross-section of a model. To do that, click on a given block and hit X, as in cross-section, on your keyboard, and it takes you into a beautiful cross-section mode. You have a triad for which you can rotate or translate where your cross-section is located. Now, this kind of brings us into the second thing to talk about, and I'm going to go into my home view, which it might be located to the right of window for you, but going into home view, we'll look at the logo driven textures file. Now one of the cousins or sisters, if you will, of the cross section is the field viewer. What is the field viewer all about? Well, it's very necessary sometimes to see what's going on. For this model, for example, I've got two blocks visible right now. The initial logo, which is our end top logo, and then a very much a wavy pattern that's based on that logo. If you look inside the wavy pattern though, you don't see a, a lot of visible things going on. What do I mean by that? Well, we're starting with this logo wave source, and then we're ending up with this wavy plate and a lot of these olive color blocks in between. And by the way, whenever you see these, if you turn the visibility, visibility on and off, you're not really going to see much. I don't encourage you to do that. Instead, you can hit F on your keyboard or go into the field viewer. What's the field viewer doing? Well, it's really showing you the underlying representation of the model, a 2D graphic representation of the fields. And what are fields? Well, those are the building blocks around or the, the methodology around which we define models and geometry inside and topology. So hitting F on any of these blocks will show you the fields and I just increase the size of what you're seeing. It's important when you go to something like a cosine block then you'll really see what's happening. So and here's a great example of why to use home view. I rotate it, I don't see what's on the screen, I hit Z or Z and it comes right back. So the field viewer is very important here if you go to probe values it is just showing you the distance from a boundary that you might be and, and it's all at a 2D representation, a, a given cross-section, of course, that you can move that any which way you want to, up or down. Uh, but again, the point to drive home is use that field viewer to get an idea of what certain blocks are doing. Very important. Otherwise, just turning the visibility on and off, you're not going to be able to tell what's happening. Next, let's transition to another file, and we're going to talk about the third thing on our list, view types. So we'll go into the topology optimization file. Right away, you should see three blocks highlighted, but one of them has a question mark. It's telling you something's wrong. It's unbuilt. It's because it's waiting for an input at the very top. I'll type in 0.5 to get things started. It's waiting for a density modifier. Now, I'm not going to go into the details about topology optimization on this video, 
but I'm just going to expose you to the different view types available in a topology. Looking at the topology optimization block uh, under this define constraints section, I'll hit I to isolate it. And this is the raw top op data. You can always use this slider, what we call a HUD over here on the right to view what happens as you change your density threshold. Now, just as before, you could also hit F and go into a field viewer and look at the density threshold as well. As you'd expect, you're going to see a series of ones and zeros or ranges or values that range from between zero and one because that's what the density threshold is all about. You can also go down to where we convert the topology optimization results and look at the implicit body for which we've converted. In fact, I'll hover over that and hit F and you see something that looks, the outline's about the same, but your values are very different because these are not the values between zero and one, but the distances in the field viewer that define the actual geometry there. So if I go back and look at that, uh, it might make a little more sense. And we can look at the smoothened body as well, which is the implicit that's been smoothened a little bit. There's a few other view types to talk about to show these. I'll go into another file, this lightweighting bike seat. And this is where I'll spend the majority of the rest of our time. So a third type of uh, view to look at is a point map or simulation data. And I'll talk more about simulation data in just a second. But if I isolate this pressure map, which is really simulation data, it is stems from uh, it's just a block or a variable from this simulation data up here. Again, you have a beautiful um, HUD, as we call it, over on the right hand side. And it's great for looking at the displacement of something. So in this case, a couple of uh, point forces were put and you can see the displacement greatly exaggerated to see exactly what the effect is going to look like. Now let's talk about point map data. If I drill over here to this block, you will see a block inside called point map. Now let me explain what's going on and I'll isolate this because we are originally taking the pressure data and we're deriving a point map from it. So we're discretizing the simulation results. Now you might ask, where are we discretizing it from? What are all the points that define that? Well, that is the mesh. That's from which it is uh, has been established. If I bump up the scale a little bit, you can tell that all the points, all the nodes on the mesh are the points of which we are defining this point map. Now, what is the point map in this case? Well, let's isolate that again. It's showing you in colors and in the vector location of the displacement on all the points along the way. The next type of data to look at is simulation data. And I mentioned we come back to that a little bit. And again, as with topology optimization, I don't want to go into a ton of detail, but I want to give just a brief survey of it. To do a simple static analysis, there's really two different elements you need to it, the model and the boundary conditions. And the model is comprised of the FE mesh and the material properties. And so we've turned both of those into variables just for organization in the tree. And the FE mesh has a series of a volume and surface meshes in it. Now, the load cases, the boundary conditions, in this case, there's a, there's a couple of forces and several restraints. And those are all five listed right up here if I want to isolate those or hit V, I can turn those on and off. You have a more complete list of boundary conditions up in the simulation tab. Uh, there's several more up here to add, but we just added a force and a restraint to simulation data. Now, let's go back to this point map because we're gonna move into properties and ships. What does this mean? Well, if I look at that point map, again, it's the pressure data discretized and we're looking at several, at any given point, the direction, of the vector and we show a color on it too. If I wanted to derive a field from that, I hit F and we turn the point map off. What is this field now? Well, if I go probe any value, and this is a 2D cross section, mind you, if I look at any value along here at any XYZ location, it's showing me the vector of the displacement and what it's doing. That may not be terribly important to me. What if I just wanna know the length of the vector at any given point? For that, I click on the question mark and go into properties, and you can look at the length. This is what we call a chip or a property that you can drag out and do anything you want with. So again, when you see olive, eh, you don't really want to go to the visibility and turn that on and off. Just go hit F. Now I'm looking at a beautiful field. It's a 2D representation. 
so I can look at what the actual displacement value is. Well, what good does that do? What good is looking at or uh, creating a field of the displacement? Well, this moves us into the sixth item we want to talk about, and this is the ramp block. Now, if I create a Voronoi lattice, a randomized lattice, let's isolate that block, uh, that's showing you a lattice that is based on the field data up above. Let me explain this. It's using an initial body and it's using a point spacing of a density modifier. What does that mean? Let's go and take a look at this density modifier. What it's doing is taking the pressure map field data and it is mapping the, in this case, the highest value I'm going to draw some arrows over here to a value of 5, and then it's taking, let's change colors to orange, the lowest value, or the in max, and mapping that over to what I'm calling the highest value. So it's taking my highest pressure in yellow, and it's saying my spacing should now be, should be 5. Then it's taking the lowest displacement, where there's not much force from someone sitting and saying, well, we can space that out a little bit more. And this clamp block just ensures that when you all put inputs in the very top of this block, you're not going to go beyond 1 or 35, reasonable values. So we're saying it should be somewhere in between. So this is really just ramping and saying, let's convert those pressure numbers into real numbers that we can use for spacing. If I were to take this density modifier out and put something like 8mm in there, then you would see a uniform Voronoi lattice. And that's not really what, we're, what we want. So in this case, some intelligent data density modifiers being used to drive the spacing, the density of the lattice. Now in the same vein, you could also use that same lattice idea to modify the thickness. And that's what we've done here. And we're restricting the values uh, as, as before, between 0.25 and 5, but we're ending up with values of 1 and 3. And those are user-defined, so you could go into this file and say, I want my smallest thickness to be 1, where the pressure is uh, greatest, and where the pressure is least, I want the thickness to be 3. So then if you look at what we call a graded thick lattice, we'll hit I, you should see something uh, accordingly. Actually, that one... Yeah, that one does have thickness values that are modified. A little bit hard to see in the very center, though. That's where the lattices are a little bit smaller. All right, speaking of lattices, uh, let's move on to the very last thing. And we'll go into a final file called field-driven lattices. This is one thing that in topology is really known for, and for good reason. Now, looking at this file, it's an initial CAD bracket that I'll pull up. We ran through a topology optimization on this to find areas of high stress. And the topology optimization was used to grade the thickness of lattices all over. So if I show, let's see, the very end block, yeah, this is cut in half, so it's much easier to see. Alternatively, you could go into the final part, uh, it's just about done rendering here, and go into a cross section, and you should see a good representation of it. So it's effectively accomplishing the same thing. There we go. Now instead, uh, well, two things to note. I could, if you've played with this file, you notice you can go in and change the graph lattice type, and this thing is going to rebuild in just a couple seconds, and that's great. One thing to note about lattices and then top it is, these are graph-based lattices. You could also use something like a TPMS, a triply periodic minimal surface, we call it. To demonstrate that, let me go into one of these sections. Here it is, and expose how we did all this. We used the interior volume after shelling this thing out, and we said, let's turn that into one giant volume lattice. And then we eventually thickened that up and trimmed it down the road. There's a different type of lattice, the TPMS I just mentioned. If you go into lattices, you'll see this block called a walled TPMS. And instead of using the interior body, maybe I want to use just the implicit bracket. To get this, to use it as an input in the next block, I'll hold down the control key and drag, and it requires if, um, just really one other input. Uh, I'm going to call it a gyroid, and let's isolate that, and you see it rebuild very quickly. All right, so now the whole thing has been turned into a TPMS. Now I think I want to increase my cell size. We'll go to five by five by five, and maybe increase the thickness to one millimeter. 
Okay, that looks a little bit more reasonable. Whenever you see a value, an input value, and you see this symbol over here, this is sort of your all ticket pass, as a colleague of mine says, your all ticket pass to fun and really experimenting and using more, uh, more intelligent data to drive things. So what if I took that thickness modifier and dragged it in here? You should now see the entire body filled with a, a gyroid TPMS, and the thickness will vary. So material... More material will exist where needed and less material where the stresses are not as high. And a cross section should show that out a little bit better. There we go. All right, so there's seven things we went through rather quickly. Visibility, field viewer, view types, simulation, properties of blocks, the ramp block, and lattices. The final thing uh, to note, what I want to end on, is please do go to our support site, support.entopology.com. Lots of helpful articles and videos and content to get you up and running and increase your knowledge of how entopology is being used out there. Thank you very much for watching.